Good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's a great morning. We have a nice service plan today. It's almost Christmas. It's the 23rd. There's some other special things going on today, too, that we're going to get to in a little bit here. I'll surprise you on that. Also, I wanted to say, yes, it's Dina's birthday. Yes. I'll sing a song to her in a little while. Here. 39. <laughs> But we have a nice service today, and I want to tell all the adults that we, the presents that are under the trees, there is one for each adult to take, you know, so, you know, and, and what you can do, and they're, they're kind of a variety of things and stuff, and if you don't like it, you can trade it with somebody else or somebody else. But then, you know, everybody, every adult can pick a, pick a present before they go home. This is at the end of the service, we'll do that and stuff, so. We don't get into a trading deal during the sermon. This Storm anyway, we're going to go ahead and start. We have a nice service plan today. So if we can stand together, we're going to start with you turn my wailing into dancing before we hit the Christmas songs. Here we go. All right. <laughs>
blessing, Lord. I thank you so much. We love you, Lord, and we just ask for a blessing on this service today that you would just touch the hearts of the people and help us think on you, Lord, and celebrate Christmas in a big way. We thank you for everything you're doing, Lord, thank and we just thank you, you so much, Lord. We praise your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Here's one we all know. Joy to the world.
Take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. Matthew chapter 1, verses 18 through 20. Praise the Lord. The thing that was conceived in her is from the Holy Ghost. I wanted you to remember that. Right now, Don is going to play a film right here. You know, Jesus, uh, we have a lot in common. Oh, yeah, what's that? We share the same holiday. The same holiday? Mm hmm. Holiday. Yeah. What, uh, what holiday is that? Christmas. Oh, you mean my birthday. You were born on Christmas? No, I, I actually, well, Christmas Eve, but yeah, I was, uh, Christmas is actually my birthday, yeah. Really? Yeah. I mean, I'm Jesus Christ, it's Christmas. That's kind of why they call it that. <laughs> well, happy birthday, Jesus Christ. <laughs> Thanks, Santa. And happy holidays to you. Can we have our ushers come forward today? We're going to play a couple more songs here.
Here we go.
Congratulations for making it this far. I know it.
And this long black limo goes by 70 miles an hour in a 55 mile an hour zone, and the trooper pulls out, and he catches the limo with no problems, and he gets, his, he gets out there, and he's getting ready to do his procedure, and the young trooper walks up to the driver's door, and when the glass is rolled down, huh, he's so surprised to see him there, he runs back to the car, and he calls a supervisor, and he tells the supervisor, I know that we're supposed to enforce the law, but I also know that important people sometimes are given certain courtesies and stuff, and we have somebody really important here. I just stopped a very important person. And the supervisor says, is it the governor? And he goes, no, he's more important than that. The supervisor <coughs> says, is it the president? And he goes, no, he's more important than that. And the supervisor <laughs> asks him, well, then who is it? And the trooper says, I think it's Jesus, because he's got T.D. Jakes driving him uh, as a chauffeur. <laughs> well, and I don't think that's a true story. No. <laughs> but I don't know. I really don't know. Let's go to the Word of God. Anyway. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this opportunity to serve you and discuss you and and talk about you, Lord, and exalt you. Lord, I pray that you open the ears and hearts and minds and eyes up of all the people here that they might receive a message, Lord, that they would be able to seal to their heart, Lord, and help them to know forever that Jesus is God. And after this message, Lord, I pray that they will have a new understanding or a better understanding of who you are, Lord. And so I thank you for this opportunity again, and I just thank you for everything you're doing in this church and in the hearts of these people. Thank you so much, Lord, for hearing this prayer today. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay, well, I want you to have God's word turn to Matthew 1, and we're going to be talking about the Christmas story for the last time here. Well, other than Monday night. But here, but we've been talking about, uh, for the year, rather. I mean, we'll be talking about it again. But we're talking about the Lord Jesus Christ, and we've talked about, how his, about his unequaled birth, because we talked about he was born of a virgin. Remember, that was the early on sermons. Then we talked about his unblemished life, because nobody, I mean, nobody ever lived a life like the Lord Jesus Christ lived. <coughs> and today we are going to talk about his unblemished deity, his deity. And we're going to be talking about the fact that the baby that was born so long ago is God in the human flesh. Okay? Yeah. yeah. Now I remember. Some years ago, and some of you do too, I'm sure you do, you remember back to the 60s, not that far ago, <laughs> and there was a movement among young people then, and many of them were out of the drug culture and everything, and it was the hippie culture and stuff, but there was a movement there called the Jesus Movement. That's right. And they were kids, Bruce remembers, I remember, <laughs> many of them were barefooted, and they were holding Bibles, and they were going around, and they were doing what they called Jesus Yells. And they were cheering the Lord Jesus, and they called themselves the Jesus Movement. Yes. And we remember that, I think, except I guess we might be dating ourselves. But, but now the strange thing about this is, is that though I didn't know what to think about the Jesus Movement then, I did know that it was better probably than, than giving, I mean, giving cheers for Jesus is better than taking drugs and doing drugs. But we saw that it was obvious that many of these people were unguided and they were untutored. And why they called themselves the Jesus Movement uh, in contradiction to the churches? Uh, because they didn't go to church. Now, you talk about stolen thunder and stuff. I mean, anyone that would call themselves a Jesus Movement over and against the organized church is kind of a weird thing. And it's because they operated outside the organized church. They didn't go to church, but they said that they loved Jesus. But I want to tell you this, that it is an indictment to any church because for an example, let me say this. In the ministry of music, we always ask the question, what are the songs, the title or the topic of the message so we can go ahead and pick the right songs? But basically, we can always be assured that we will be singing, if we sing about Jesus, will always fit the sermons anymore. If we sing about Jesus, it always fits. It will fit and it will match because every sermon is all about Jesus. However, I feel that these Jesus kids missed it a tad because any so-called Jesus movement that is not church-centered is really not a Jesus movement. Okay? I'm going to turn that around. You see, any so-called church that is not a truly Jesus-centered church is not a true church, too. But when we keep that in mind, and let's look at the Christmas story, because we're speaking of Joseph. And I want to tell you about that Jesus loves the church. And so if you're going around loving Jesus without loving the church, you're missing something. Now, we're going to read Matthew 1, verses 20 through 23, 
And we're going to probably read that uh, two or three times today. And we're going to read it once right now. But I want you to see some things in it, in this Christmas story. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord. You know who the angel of the Lord is? Jesus. You know the theophany of Jesus before he was born in the flesh? The angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her already is of the Holy Ghost. Is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the pro Lord by the prophet, saying, and this is Isaiah 7, 14, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So who was the child that was born that day? Who is this one that we call Jesus? Now, well, I've said it before, there's one right answer, but there's many, many, many wrong answers. And there are those who say Jesus is a great man. Listen, without a shadow of a doubt, he was a great man. But if you just tip your hat to Jesus, you've missed it all. We talked about that very carefully last week. You know, H.G. Wells, the atheist, made a list of 10 greatest men in history, and Jesus Christ was number one on that list. He talked about Charlemagne. He talked about Alexander the Great. But he said Jesus is more than Jesus the Great. He is Jesus the one and only. And this is an atheist. Now the late Dr. Criswell said this. To compare the greatest men on earth like Alexander and Caesar and Shakespeare with Jesus is like comparing a grain of dust with the whole universe. It's like comparing a molehill to Mount Everest. And I say amen to that. But still some say that he's just a great man. And you know there are some that speak about him as just some kind of moral teacher. But I, let me tell you what C.S. Lewis said about one of the greatest packages. And I'm trying to prevent anyone from saying the foolish thing that people say about him, that I'm ready to accept Jesus Christ as a great teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. We've all heard that before so many times. I'm ready to accept Jesus as a great teacher, but I don't accept his claim to be God. And they tell us that this is one thing that we should not say in the world. Now, we say, I have to say this, though, that a man that would merely, a man that said the sort of things that Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He'd be a lunatic. He would. Or the level of a man that was said he was a poached egg. He would be like the devil of hell or a liar because it confronts us with the things that he says, and you have to make a choice on what's true. Either he was the man and is the son of God, and the person that he said he is, or he's a madman or something worse. You have to choose. I mean, you can show him up for a fool, you can spit on him, you can kill him for a demon, or you can receive him and fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. You've only got two choices, because when the end comes, you'll do one or the other. And let none of us come away with any patronizing thought or nonsense about him that he's just a great human teacher. He has not left that open for us to say. And you say, well, he's more than the moral teacher. Maybe he's a prophet too. And others say, like New Agers, they say he's the mystic medium, that Jesus is the way to God, that Jesus is the channel to know God. And so they do what they think is concourse with the Almighty through their mystic Jesus and their crystal Christ, who is really, the Bible says, just a demon fooling these people, just imitating the Lord Jesus Christ. Because there are demons who call themselves Jesus. That's all there is to it. Now, we better understand who this Jesus is without any stutter, stammer, or apology or quibble. Because, listen, Jesus is God in the human flesh. And that's who the Lord Jesus is. It's God in the flesh. On your outline, so not only is he the Son of God, but he is the God, the Son he is God the Son. And this brings us to a doctrine that we need to emphasize more these days than ever before, and that's about his deity. Now, this we're going to be talking about is Christianity 101, the basics here. And this is the doctrine of the Trinity. The Trinity. I want you to see this passage that we have already read. We've already seen the Holy Trinity in there. But, for example, I want to read it one more time. Let's look at Matthew 22, 23 one more time, and I want you to see it here. So he says... But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord, who is the Lord, appeared unto him in the dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, 
Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. So the Holy Ghost has made Jesus, okay? And she shall bring forth a son, there's the son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. And that's what we need salvation from, believe me. The devil just tempts us into these things, but we go ahead and go, okay, we submit and we, we need help. And now all of this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold a virgin. Now this is Isaiah 7, 14. Behold a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted God with us. So there we see the whole thing. We see the Father, we see the Son, we see the Holy Spirit, and it is God in three persons, okay? Now listen, the doctrine of the Trinity on your outline is the great Christian distinctive. Without the Trinity, it separates many, many faiths from our faith. The great distinctive is one God in three persons. If you misunderstand this, it will lead to heresy. If you miss the Trinity, you have missed the meaning of the message of the Bible and the, that God is God of three in one or one in three. Let me show you how God the Father is described in the Bible. What is the most holy name for God in the Old Testament? What is it? It is the great, on your outline, the great I Am. The great I Am is the holy name of God, and it is the one that is uh, very, it's the, the most important one. Moses says, God, I've introduced to you these people, to these people, who should I say you are? Moses says, who are you? Let me read it to you in Exodus, Donald Turner, Exodus 3.14. And he says, and God said unto Moses, I am that I am. Those are, those are like words out of a sentence. That's not really a name, is it? I am that I am. He's kind of telling us what he is, not what his name is, really, it seems like. But he says, I am that I am. Thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel, I am hath sent me to you. I am that I am, not I was, not I will be, I am the great I am. It means that he is existence and he is working all the time. I am has sent me to you. I'm going to give you a brief rundown real quick like here. <coughs> God in Genesis 1 who made the heavens and the earth is God's. It's Elohim. We'll talk about that in a minute. And then when we move to chapter 2 and verse 4, he becomes more personal and it says, Lord God. Lord God does this, and it's kind of speaking about the Word and God together, speaking of God personally, communicating with people. And then when we get to Exodus 3.14, the Lord finally says, call me the great I Am, which we're looking at right now, which is the most holy and eternal. In Exodus 6.3, he says his name is Yahweh, or Jehovah, which is translated Lord we start off with Yahweh, it ends up being Jehovah, and Jehovah ends up becoming Lord because they don't want to write Jehovah all the time. And so he's saying, basically, that there never was a time when I was not. And he calls himself, I am that I am, and he's saying he always was. He is and is to come. And that is the holy, mystical, wonderful name of Jehovah God, I am. So he's eternal. Now remember, that's how God showed himself to Moses. So you've got that now. Think about that. Now Pharisee, the Pharisees had Jesus on the grill in the New Testament. And these Pharisees who had the milk of human kindness that had curdled completely, who were envious of this Jesus Christ and his Jesus movement, actually sneered at Jesus. He went to the temple, but he didn't buy into their doctrine. He was defacing their doctrine. And that's when, they, of course, they insulted him and told him that he was born in fornication. We know that Jesus had spoken of Abraham, too. And he said that you can remember in John 8 where Jesus is speaking to the Pharisees. And this is what Jesus says in John 8, verses 56 through 58. Listen to what he says here. Your father Abraham rejoiced to see my day. And he saw it and was glad. Then said the Jews unto him, Thou art not even fifty years old, and hast thou seen Abraham? And Jesus said unto them, Verily, verily, truly, truly, I say unto you, before Abraham was, I am. They just freaked out about that, too. I am. And what is the great holy name of God? I am. He is the great I am. And Jesus asked, I mean, they asked Jesus, have you ever seen Abraham? And he said, before Abraham got here, I am. There never was a time when he was not, because Jesus is the Son of God. He was the Word before it became flesh. He was the Word that was with God in the beginning. 
Now, after this, the Bible says that they took up stones to stone him. They were so furious about this. Because why? They didn't miss the message. It was blasphemy to them. And I mean that he would so identify himself with that name, the great I am. Which brings us to this. Now, listen on your outline. God the Father is God. God the Son is God. And God the Holy Spirit is God. And there is the Trinity. Now, the Christmas story, we see that the Holy Spirit overshadows Mary, and it says he is the one that caused the pregnancy in Mary, and he also is God because Jesus is the Son of God made by the Holy Spirit, according to the flesh, God incarnate. And you say, well, you don't agree with others that the Holy Spirit, don't you think the Holy Spirit is just an influence that's emanating from God? No, no. The Holy Spirit is a person on your outline. The Holy Spirit is a person who feels, who wills, who acts, who lives, who can be abused, who impregnated Mary. And the Bible says, grieve not the Holy Spirit of God, whether you are shielded until the day of redemption. Listen, you can't grieve an influence. You can only grieve on your outline a person. Here's something else. You can only grieve a person that on your outline loves you. The neighbor kids will vex you, but your own kids will grieve you, remember? And amen to that. Now, you can only grieve someone who loves you. Now, let me give you the scripture that talks about the deity of the Holy Spirit. In Acts 5, there were some people, Ananias and Sapphira, and you know the story. They had lied to the apostles, and they lied to the early church. And here's the scripture. We're going to turn to it in Acts 5, verses 3 and 4. Look at this. But Peter said, Ananias... Why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? While it remained, was it not thine own? He had a whole piece of property, and he said he sold it all and gave it to them, but he only gave half of it to the church. That was a wonderful thing to do to the church, but he lied. And after it was sold, was it not thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. So he's lied unto God. Did you catch that? Why did you lie to the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost? Because you lied to God. So the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, and they're three in one. They are three. Holy, 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 merciful and mighty God in three persons. Blessed Trinity. We sing it all the time. We've sang it many times. Did you know what you were singing? There are three things, or three points that I want you to notice. So first, I want you to think about on your outline, number one, the unfathomable mystery of the Trinity. The mystery. Now, we've already shown you the Trinity in the Christmas story, but look, if you will, I want to show you some more places. Look at 1 Timothy 3.16. We've read it several times, and without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. God was manifested in the flesh justified in the spirit, seen of angels, preached unto the Gentiles, believed on in the world, and received up into glory. And I tell you, without controversy, great is the mystery of godliness. We see God was manifested in the flesh. That's Jesus. And you say, Pastor, I just don't understand it. Well, good. I don't either. I'm glad you don't understand it, and I don't understand it, because if we can't understand it, that means it must be believed. Blind faith we need to have. We cannot understand everything. I wouldn't have confidence in a God I could understand. And John Wesley said, how can a worm understand a man? How can we understand God? How can the finite know the infinite? How can we unpick the mysteries of the Holy Trinity? You see, the Trinity is not given us to understand on your outline it was given to us to believe. It was given to us to believe. It is a mystery, and it goes beyond logic, and it goes beyond, beyond philosophy, and it goes beyond science and mathematics. But don't think that we're going to cram God into our little suitcase or into our little intellect in order to understand. And listen, there are just so many things in the natural realm that we don't understand. We've talked about that. For example, you don't understand how the muck and the mire and the dirt, a beautiful flower can grow. Other things that we don't begin to understand. Which of us understands the infinity? Something that never ends, like space. Here's another. Tell me, who can understand eternity? Something that never begins and never ends. Listen, our minds just stop. 
Because everything we know has a beginning and an ending. And everything that we know has a starting place and an ending place. But then there's infinity and there's eternity. And these things, frankly, are just beyond us. So don't try to prove the Trinity. Just throw those test tubes away, put away your computer and your side rulers and yeah. bow in the dust and open the Bible and just believe it because it's settled in his word. It's all about faith. No, no, this is an undoubtable mystery, all right, but it's nonetheless true. With faith, we don't need to understand everything. You know, so often people try to race their theological motors and try to illustrate the Trinity, you know, with water, ice, and, and steam, and things like that and stuff, but uh, there, there's, we can't compare God to anything. We try to compare God to something, but there's only one God on your outline, and there is nothing to compare him to. A girl went with her boyfriend, and she went out with another boy one night, and she confessed to her boyfriend, I went out with Henry, and Henry <coughs> kissed me, and he said, he did, I'll teach Henry. And she said, no, you couldn't teach Henry anything. <laughs> you see, we can compare one kiss with another kiss, but you can't compare God with anyone because there's only one God. Let me give you this verse, Isaiah 40, 18. It says, to whom then will ye liken God? Or what likeness will you compare unto him? So don't ever make the mistake of saying God is like this or like that. Whom will we liken God to? And I'll tell you, one kiss may be or may not be like another kiss, but there's only one God, just one God. However, we see reflections of the Trinity everywhere. And like I said, now listen to this, I said reflections, not proofs. For example, time and space makes up our universe. Well, what is time on your outline? Time is past, present, and future. There's three things there, isn't there? Well, what is space? Space is height, width, and depth. All of them belong together, don't they? But each are distinguishable. But all are inseparable, aren't they? You can't have past without present. You can't have present without future. You can't have future without past. Each are distinguishable, and all are part of one, and that's time. You see, they're all distinguishable, but they're all inseparable. And however, it's not proof of the Trinity. It's still only a reflection, but it's like space. Think about space, height and width and depth. You can't have height without depth, width. You can't have width without depth, and you can't have depth without height. Each is distinguishable, but all are inseparable, and that's space. Well, why? Because we are, they're reflections of the great God who has made everything. God in three persons, and we are in the third dimension. They say the fourth dimension is time, which includes all the third dimension. Interesting as that is. I believe God's in that dimension, but this is an unfathomable mystery. Now, sometimes we will use false analogies, and someone will say, oh, I get it, Pastor. It's like, you're Jackie's husband, you're my pastor, and all of his grandpa. No, 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 that's modelism. That means God, uh, you know, it's uh, not God acting in three ways. It's God in three persons is what it is. They're different and they're distinct. And so we see it. You probably don't understand, and I don't understand. It's a very hard thing to understand, but it is to be believed. And the closer you come to the Lord, the more you see the reality of it, and the more you can feel it and understand it. Look what it says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9. It says, For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. You know, a wise man once said, Don't try to explain the Trinity. You'll lose your mind. But don't deny the Trinity, or you'll lose on your outline your soul. You lose your soul. How do we know it? By divine revelation as we open the word of God. <clears throat> and you see, the only knowledge that we have of the Most High is, now listen, when he discloses himself to us. This is how we know about God. We see Jesus. And there's the second thing here I want you to see right now. I not only want you to see the unfathomable mystery, but I want you to see number two on your outline, the unfolded manifestation of the Trinity. Manifestation means made known. If God is the triune God, then you would expect him to manifest himself, which indeed he did do. Let's go back to our scripture in Matthew 1, and we'll read just 22 and 23. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted, God with us. God with us. Now, God has given us, 
Old Testament prophecy that is coming. And there he unfolds these things to us. Now, Isaiah said it first. I told you Isaiah 7, 14. And then we see it again here in Matthew. We just read it. And, and we see that I want to show you right now. I'm going to go to the Old Testament quickly and see if we can find the Trinity right there, right there in the Old Testament. And hallelujah, we do. Right on the very first verse of the whole Bible. The very first verse of the whole Bible. Genesis 1, 1, it says, God created the heaven and the earth. And you say, well, I don't see the Trinity there. Bear with me. I've already told you the Hebrew word for God right there is Elohim, which is plural. Elohim is a plural noun. El is a singular appellative for God. The singular name for God is El. And then if you add M to it, you get Elohim. And then that is pluralizes it. God's is what it's saying. For example, a seraph, you know, the seraphim. Seraph is one angel. Seraphim is lots of angels. A cherub is one angel. Cherubim there's lots of angels. So it's a plural noun, and this plural noun could be translated gods. Now, we know that there is only one God, but the Holy Spirit inspired Moses to write down a plural noun, didn't he? Because Moses wrote the first book, so Elohims created the heavens and the earth. Now, what is this? This is God acting in unity. This is a triune God. Now, I want you to think about that. Keep that in mind. Remember the baby in Bethlehem was the one that created the manger, the very stable in which he was born in John 1. So remember it said in Genesis in the beginning, God's created the heaven and the earth. Well, look what it says in John 1, 3 here. John 1, 3, it says this. And uh, I can repeat it. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. And, it, and the same was in the beginning was with God. And all things were made by him, and nothing, and without him was not anything made that was made. So we see that Jesus made everything. He was a part of it. Now I'm going to explain that a little better here. The Word is the Bible description of Jesus. And the Word was in the beginning with God. And so we see without Jesus there was not anything made that was made. Now do you see that? So we see the babe of Bethlehem is the mighty God of Genesis 1. Jesus speaks to Joseph in a dream while Mary is already conceived, and nothing was made without him. So the babe of Bethlehem is the mighty God of Genesis 1. And you see it, it's the great commandment that God gave Israel. You'll know it from this one, the Shema and stuff, the command that God gave to Israel that every Orthodox Jew knows by heart called the Shema. And it's Deuteronomy, the most quoted text in the Bible from Jesus. Not this text, but I mean Deuteronomy. He quoted out of it more than anything else. Chapter 6, verse 4 and 5. The Jews use this as a prime protext of the unity of God. And you have heard this many times. The Lord our God, I'll say Elohim, the Lord our God is one Lord, and thou shalt love the Lord with all thy heart, with all thy soul, with all thy might. Now the word Lord is translated the word Yahweh. Or Jehovah. Remember, Yahweh eventually turns into Jehovah. And Jehovah is one Lord. Now, Jehovah is personal, and it means Lord. But it's like this. They also believe the Lord, our Elohim, is one Lord. Jehovah, our God, is one Lord. That's Yahweh, our Elohim. And so we see the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit. The Father and the Word and the Holy Spirit. The Jews believe that. They just don't believe the part that the Word became flesh. That's the New Testament. The Word became flesh and made himself known to us. And we rejected him. They don't believe that stuff. They don't think the Messiah ever came. But he did. The Word became flesh. We believe the New Testament. We believe that the two Testaments are two witnesses for God. The Old Testament and the New Testament. What I'm trying to show you here is that even in the great confession of Israel, there are reflections of the Trinity here. And when it says, Jehovah, our Elohim, is one Lord, Echad Lord, he uses the word for one in Hebrew, that's Echad. Echad. If we were to angleize it, it would mean one, but not a singular one. It's a plural one. What? And you say, well, how can you have a plural one? Well, let me give it to you in some other places where the word is used, Echad. In Genesis 2, 24, when the Bible speaks of husband and wife coming together, it says they two should be a God. They two should be one flesh. Or are they two or are they one? Yeah, that's the answer, yeah. 
Well, let me get it to you again. In Genesis 11, 6, at the Tower of Babel, God says the people were bad. And he says the people are one. All of them are echad. They're all one. So the same word there is used, the Lord thy God is one echad. Echad. We use the same thing for Numbers 13, 23. One cluster of grapes. You have many grapes, and but you only have one cluster. Well, in Hebrew, what's the plural unity? Grape echad. Okay, so you get that. So here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one Lord. Jehovah, our Elohim, is one Jehovah. Echad, Elohim. Does that have you scratching your head? Scratching your head? It should, probably, but... We don't learn of God's word or God's son until we get to the New Testament, do we? No. Oh, no. We didn't learn about it before that. Where? Well, right there in Daniel, we see where there's one place. We learn about God's son in the Old Testament. Look what it says in Daniel 3.25. Let's see what it says here. In Daniel 3.25, it says this. He answered and said, the king was looking in there. I see four men loose walking in the midst of the fire, and they have no hurt. And the form of the fourth is like the Son of God. How in the world did Nebuchadnezzar, an unsaved guy, know what the Son of God looked like? There's something about the heavenly things where you will understand things. But that's what he says. Tell me who walked with Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego when they were walking through the furnace? Jesus, it was the angel of the Lord, the king's epiphany of Christ, the Ophany, who was called the angel of the Lord or the son of God was in there. Look what it says in Proverbs 30, verse 4. Look what it says, Proverbs verse 4, 30. Who hath ascended up into hev heaven or descended? Who hath ascended up into heaven or descended? Who hath gathered the wind in his fist? Who hath bound the waters in his garment? Who hath established all the ends of the earth? What is his name? And what is his son's name? <coughs> if you can't tell. Uh-oh. That's Proverbs. That's Solomon. There's a question for the ancients. That was written 700 years before Christ. And his name is Jehovah. His son's name is Jesus. And that's the answer. God has a son. Well, what was God's purpose with his son? Well, let's read the Old Testament again. Here's the Almighty. Listen to what David has to say, except this is Jesus talking right here in Psalms 2, verses 6 and 7. Look what Jesus says. Yet I set my king upon my holy hill of Zion. I will declare the decree. The Lord hath said unto me, Thou art my son this day. I have begotten thee. Of course, we know that is after he's in heaven, after he has, not when he was born in the flesh down here, but after he took his blood and he was in visible form and presented the blood before the altar in front of God. And that is when he became his son. And we see another picture of that in Hebrews, and we can get into that, but we won't right now. But I'm talking about Old Testament here. We're talking about the Christmas verse, like Isaiah 6. Think about Isaiah 6 that we've read on so many Christmas cards. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulders. That's the millennium. And his name shall be called Wonderful. Jesus shall be called Counselor. He is my Counselor. Jesus shall be called the Mighty God. Jesus shall be called the Everlasting Father because he made you. And Jesus shall be called the Prince of Peace. Now, the child of born is the babe in Bethlehem. But the son is given is the everlasting Jesus. Amen. The government that will be on his shoulders, of course, is in the millennium. And he will be called Wonderful Counselor. And he will be called the Mighty God. El Gabor is what it says there. That's the word in Hebrew. Who is the name? The baby? You're calling that baby El Gabor, the Mighty God? Yeah, Isaiah the prophet did. He called it that baby El Gabor in Hebrew. And you know what El Gabor means? It means the God-man. The God-man, that's Isaiah 9, 6. That's on the Christmas verse and stuff. Spoken 700 years before the word was incarnated where Jesus Christ was born in a virgin. Let's look at Isaiah 21. It says this, 10, 21. The remnant shall return, even the remnant of Jacob to the mighty God. That means the Jews are going to finally return to Jesus. They will. And there, without a shadow of doubt, is talking about Jehovah. Jesus is called Jehovah, El-Gabar, 
And therefore, in the New Testament, when we come to the miracle story of the birth of the Lord Jesus Christ, which is the Christmas story, it is no amazement to us that we see God the Spirit and God the Father and God the Son coming together in this wonderful Christmas story. And this Gospel of Matthew, it begins in Matthew 1 that we read, starting and talking about the Holy Trinity. It concludes in Matthew 28, giving the Great Commission to the church, where we see the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. In, first, in chapter 28 of Matthew. And here's something else. Think about this. When we baptize people, what do we baptize them? We baptize them in the Trinitarian formula on your outline. Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. That's how we baptize. Now, that would be blasphemy if Jesus was not God. That would be blasphemy to put himself on the same plane and to include the Holy Spirit, which is our soul sealer. But he said to baptize him in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost. So if Jesus is not God, if he's not co-equal, co-eternal with God the Father on your outline, it would be blasphemy. So, you know, you can take the Bible as kind of a wonderful book, but the more you read it and the more in depth you get into it, it's going to define things. It's going to make you see doctrine. You can't keep from it if you know the Bible. The best way to keep from doctrine is don't ever read it. Don't ever think about it. And that's not, that's against the rules. You're supposed to be daily devotions, you know. Have you got it? Now for the third and final thing, let's move on. I want you to see number three, the unchanging um, ministry of the Trinity. The unchanging ministry of the Trinity. We're almost done here. Now there's the unfathomable mystery. A mystery unfathomable Un manifested, excuse me, made known. Um, why all the fuss about it, though? What a difference does it really make? I mean, really, I'll tell you, your destiny rides on it. Let's go back and read this Matthew one last time. We've read it a bunch of times. Here we go, one more time, 20 through 23. But while he thought on these things, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, Fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife, for that, that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Now all of this was done, that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, a virgin shall be with child, and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. So there it is again, the Holy Trinity and the Father and the Son and the Holy Ghost is there. And we see it all works together on your outline in your salvation. Your salvation needed all three of these beings, all three of the Trinity. You were, on your outline, selected by the Father. He knows how many hairs you have numbered and you were selected before the foundations of the world and he loved you before you were born but you were saved by the son because of all that work he did he came down and lived an unblemished life and went to the cross and left the riches of heaven to go ahead and live like that but we were sealed by the holy spirit the holy spirit is the sealer that keeps us that keeps me from letting me lose my salvation the Holy Spirit, that's so important. All together, this is the way you're saved. That's the reason that the Apostle, Apostle Paul said this. And this is the last scripture here, 2 Corinthians 13, 14. It says, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Ghost be with you all. So on your outline, we see God loves you. Jesus saves you. And the Holy Spirit empowers you. This is how we can do the extraordinary, because of the Holy Spirit. But you have to be saved. And that was the blessed benediction that Paul gave to the church. And my time is gone. But I want to close with a story and think about it. You may have heard it before. I don't remember. But George Duncan of England told the story, and I want to share it with you right now. He said, back in the Second World War, there was a man, a British man. He was very wealthy, and he had a son. And that son was in the Royal Air Force, the RAF, and that was the British Air Force. And he was shot down in flames and was killed in the war, in World War II. And this left this man, this father, who had this wife had previously died, who had an immense amount of wealth. 
but he had no relatives, and he had no other descendants. So his son was lost in battle for Britain. Well, there came a time when this man died himself. He died, and he wrote a will. And his estate said that his estate was to be sold and given to various charities. And he said my art collection was to be auctioned off. And he had the incredible, an incredible art collection. Now the famous Sofer Bees, which is an auction outfit and stuff, was going to go ahead and do the auction. And the people came from all over. All kinds of came from everywhere, from art collectors, because he had a very, very valuable collection. They were all salivating for the opportunity to bid on it. The auctioneer, or the executor, said, first of all, we're going to auction off one painting. And it was there, and it was on the tripod, and they unveiled it. And it was a painting of the man, of Ned, the wealthy man's son. And it was a self-portrait of the one who died. Well, few, if any, out there knew the boy. And he was not a well-known artist, and they didn't know. They didn't know who he was. And so it was valueless to everybody there. And so nobody bid on it. But one man who was an old friend of the family, and he knew the boy, and he had seen the boy grow up, and he thought it would be nice to have a painting of the lad. Well, he said, I knew him, and I watched him, and I loved him, and so he bid on it. He made one bid, and there was only one bid on it, and there was no other bids on it. And the auctioneer said, do I hear any more bids at all? And he said, very well. If there's no more bids, it is sold to this individual. But then he said, now the auction's over. And they said, what? No. He said, yes, the auction's over. I was forbidden to tell you this, but it was written in the will that whoever buys this picture gets the picture and the entire collection. And he said, whoever gets the sun gets all the rest. Wow. So you see, we get it all on your outline when we receive Jesus. We don't understand how much we receive when we really receive him. And I mean, you know, he gave all of him to all of us. We need to give all of us to him. When you only do it half-heartedly, you do not get the power from the Holy Spirit. You do not grow. You do not move forward. You need to exercise the power in the Holy Spirit. You need to have your faith in him and get in with both feet. I want you to hear this poem. I've tried in vain a thousand ways. My fears to quell, my hopes to raise, when all I need, the Bible says, is Jesus. My soul is night, my heart is steel. I cannot see, I cannot feel. For light in my life, I must appeal to Jesus. He dies, he lives, he reigns, he pleads. There's love in all his words and deeds. And all a guilty sinner needs is Jesus. Though some will mock and some will blame, in spite of sin, in spite of shame, I'll go to him because his name is Jesus. Thou shalt call his name Jesus, for he shall save his people from their sins. Oh, Lord, how we need to be saved from our own sins. I want to remind you, too, that you know we always think of the devil, but we have a whole millennium where the whole world strays away from God while the devil's been locked up for a thousand years. And we still do it, because we have wicked nature in our heart. I'll be talking about that tomorrow night at our candlelight service. But I want to lead you in a prayer right now, because that is the deity of Christ. <coughs> Let's bow our heads. And in this prayer, you can give an everlasting yes. So I want you to pray a prayer like this. Hit these buttons. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you. Lord, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we just I just pray that everybody would enter into your world, Lord, and that you would help people, help people to grow and to want you more than they do, Lord. To help them to see their need for you, Lord. Because the world is passing and the things of the world will be getting dim as you start growing in our life. And that is so important, Lord, that we have our focus on you. So, Lord, we believe you're the Son of God, and we believe that you died for our sins. We believe that you paid for our sins with your shed blood. We believe that you rose from the dead. You said if we trusted you, you'd save us. We do trust you, Lord. Come into our life. Come into us now, Lord, and forgive our sins. Come into our life and make us be the people that you want us to be. Help us to never be ashamed of you, Lord. And, oh, Lord, I want to make you Lord of my life. Instead of just saying, I know who you are. We need to be possessed, the Lord. It's a scary thing to think about being possessed when we think about the occult or other things. 
But to be possessed by you is to have something perfect. So, Lord, I pray that we would seek you with a whole heart. And we just thank you, Lord. I thank you for your word and these people. And I just pray that they would just open up their hearts and that they would put you in their life more and more and more. Help them, Lord, for your request is for them to be holy. Your request is for them to be saved. Your request for them is to share the good news with others. And so, Lord, again, we thank you. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for this message, and I thank you for all the people that came and heard it. We turn this service over to you again, Lord, and we thank you. And we ask for all of these things. In your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. <laughs> Praise God. Well, we have one last song today. I hope you guys are certain about the Trinity now and the deity of God. Here we go. Let's stand together. We're going to sing, Oh, come all ye faithful. It's our last Christmas song on the Sunday mornings before Christmas. We have a set of things tomorrow night. Candlelight service, 6 o'clock. Here we go. Oh, come on, you faithful. silent about you, Lord. Help them to share you with others as they go through this season. But just bless them with the joy that comes from obedience, the joy that comes from knowing you, Lord. Bless them really good. And we thank you for that. And we thank you for all that have come, Lord. So just touch their lives with Christmas one more time. And we thank you. And we ask for all of these things, Lord, in your precious name we pray. In Jesus' name. And the church said, Amen. 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 Go with God. Everybody. Forget the presents. Oh, don't forget, you adults, to get one present. To make sure you get a present. Don't take our joy away. You know, grown up. Somebody bring me one. You might want to look at it unless you want to trade. You know? <laughs>
I get what's left. <laughs> Somebody bring me one. I grabbed you one that's like mine. <laughs> Mine feels the same as yours. A little tin. Yeah. Tin, tin, tin. Part of the movement, right? <laughs> Have a good time. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Thank you so much. <laughs> 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 